So yes, as the most most of you know, I can see. Um, so yes, we have our notes pages underneath. We have Bibles underneath. We're going to be diving in today. So super excited. So today's sermon is going to be going over our greatest need, which is the gospel. Okay, I'm going to start off with a little story. I think you guys will like it. So, what is, what is this? Salamander. It's a salamander. Or a newt. Yeah, the salamander. Okay. So, mine and Kim's bedroom at home is in the basement, and every morning I wake up and I look out the window well to see if there's any animals that are stuck out there, um, specifically for salamanders. I... <laughs> I, I found a couple salamanders um, just recently, um, and I just think they're they're super cute, and I think they're really cool. I don't know, it, it's not like a snake, it's not like a, I don't know, it, it's just, it's really cute, and it seems like they're always smiling. Um, really like them. But if you know salamanders, they love shady, wet places, they like hiding underneath rocks or underneath logs, they like digging their own little holes, and they always need to be moist. Um, but in the rare occasion, an unintentional salamander will wander his way in the middle of the night and fall into the window well. Um, and from this, I can see truly how fragile life is. Um, because within a couple days, if that salamander does not get rescued, he will <coughs> start to lose all of his moisture. He'll start to dry up, and he'll be dead within a couple days. And he just shrivels up. So I try to be intentional because I think they're super cute. Love them. Um, they're beautiful creatures that God has created. Um, and so the salamander's greatest need is to be rescued from the window well. Um, it's also super cool. You just put a little water on them. They're just like a little sponge, and they just soak it right in. They're good to go. Um, but you can really see that, like, if they stay in there, like, they'll die, like, very, very quickly. So as a high schooler, it's a little bit different, but what is your greatest need? You know, in, in the season of homecoming, is it for a homecoming date? Is that your greatest need right now? Is it to pass your next math test that you've been studying for, or any of your AP classes? Is it for a chance to show your athletic abilities on the field or on the court? Is that your greatest need, your biggest need right now? Or is it getting likes on Instagram or TikTok? We can also look at what is the world's greatest need. Is it for poverty to end? Is it for world peace? Is it for government accountability, free education, clean water? food, resources for everyone, health care. What's in common with all of these things, all these problems that we have? Each of these problems is a complete blip, which is a super, super small amount of time um, of momentary affliction, which is momentary suffering compared to eternity. All these things. We, we look at it in hindsight. Like there's so many things that used to be such a big deal to us when we were younger, and we can see how those things really weren't that big of a deal to us. But as your youth pastor, like I've, I love you guys, and I care about sharing truth with you, and I care about speaking words into you. But comparing being truly transformed in knowing Jesus by the saving power of his gospel, which is about him and which is from him to any other problems in your life, I need to say that Jesus is your greatest need and the only thing that you truly need. Does this mean that your current hardships are unimportant or meaningless? No, not at all. But we can be reminded that every second your hardships or your struggles are completely meaningful in the eyes of the Lord. We can see this in, in Romans 5, 3 through 5. Um, we'll be getting into this later on in the year, but Paul writes, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. So, God sees you, he created you, he sustains you, he has set you apart from all of creation, you guys are not like salamanders that when a salamander's life is over, it's over, it's done. But God has created all of you in his image, and he has given you an eternal soul. 
something that does last forever. It is not just this life, and that's why we come before Jesus each and every day, because this isn't just it. It isn't just this life. It is not about living your best life now, because there is an entire eternity to come. So, as we're going to be getting into Romans, I'm going to be helping you guys get a little bit of a framework of what the city of Rome looks like in the first century. So if you guys want to open up your Bibles to the book of Romans, so it's in the New Testament, it's near the end of the book, or near the end of the Bible, kind of, like you cut the Bible in the middle and then you go to like a fourth in it. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. If you start getting into 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, you're too far. We're going to be starting right away at Romans chapter 1. If you have a friend by you that needs a little bit of help, I didn't know how to work my way through the Bible until a few years ago, so it's nothing to be discouraged about. (coughs) Okay, Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to be at today. So, Paul is writing to the Christians within the city of Rome. So, which at this time is at the center of the whole Roman Empire, and the city of Rome had a population of around one million people. This is a drawing, but this is probably what it kind of looked like. About one million people, with the majority of the population consisting of slaves. So, the Roman population of about a million, about 600 to 700,000 of them were slaves. Um, They were not slaves like that we think of, like with the Civil War, where it was slavery over a specific race or a specific color of people. But this was slavery based on your social level. So people that are more poor than you, people that their last name isn't the same as you, it's being able to have slavery over those people. It was people that when they won won wars or won battles, they would take the other army and they would make slaves of those people. Um, it was it was super sad. Even even Roman citizens would sell their children to become slaves in times that they needed money. So this was the culture of Rome, that this is just what happened. It was slavery all around the door, like all around every corner. Um, And as we look into um, the city further, specific buildings like the Colosseum, um, which is one of the famous buildings. In the first century, they hosted gladiator games. So there was battles to the death, kind of like Hunger Games style in public, like where we go and we watch football games. This is what they watch. They watch people fighting to the death gruesome, gruesome fights, and they would even have animals like lions and tigers and bears and elephants and all these different all these different creatures that people would have to fight with their bare hands. Sometimes they didn't even get any weapons. Um, and this was a common place for also public executions and Christians being martyred, dying for the faith that they had in Jesus. Um, there was also the Pantheon. Um, which was just one of the one of the many temples in Rome where they went and they worshipped all their Roman gods. So hundreds of Roman gods. We think of Greek mythology, um, and it was just all over the place. Like they would go and they would worship to these false idols, and Rome was just filled with sin and immorality um, everywhere you turned. So Paul is writing this letter to the Christians that are in Rome. So if we like when we when we we're going to take ourselves and we're going to put ourselves back into the text, like for us to be able to understand the application to the fullness of it. Um, so yeah, that's that's the big big picture of behind. Um, so we're going to be opening with verses one through seventeen. That's that's what we're going to be looking at today, and we're going to be breaking it down into three main sections. Number one, if you guys have your Bibles, it's going to be probably pretty similar to how I break it down. So the first section is going to be verses 1 through 7, which is going to be an introduction and greeting from Paul. The second one is going to be verses 8 through 15. That is going to be Paul longing or him desiring to go to Rome. And the last section that we're really going to be focusing on is the righteous shall live by faith. So as we're going into today, we're going to be preaching, or I'm going to be preaching verse by verse Um, giving you a clear understanding. This is how we read our Bibles. This is how we understand what's going on in the text, and this is how we apply it. Um, We are to be students of the Word, to seek the Lord in in His Word. Um, So, can I have a volunteer 
to read verses 1 through 7, please. Oh, okay, we got Nate, and then we got Kobe on the next reading. Thank you. Okay, read, read extra loud. Nice deep voice. Paul, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised before the answered prophets in the Holy Scripture regards it to some who, who as his earthly life was a descendant of David, who was through the spirit of holiness the Son of God and God. By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through, through him you, you receive grace and apostleship to call all the gentle, Gentiles to that obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to, to by his holy people, Awesome, thank you, Nate. So, as we're looking at this, so this is Paul's introduction to the letter. This is how he's, he's introducing himself to the Christian church in Rome. He hasn't gone to Rome yet, um, but he's writing this letter to the Christians who are in Rome because he desires to go and see them. So, he starts off with this verse right away. <coughs> He calls himself a servant. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. He calls to be an, an apostle. So the Greek word, which is super cool, getting to see like the actual word and terminology that Paul used, he used the word doulos. So we can see, you can see this middle word, doulos, as Greek. Um, we have English for servant, but it literally means slave. So as we were just talking about, he's writing to these Christians in, in Rome, and the majority of the people in Rome are slaves. So Paul introduces himself saying, hey, I'm Paul, and I am a slave to Jesus. So in this culture where slavery is so abundant, he goes off and says right away, I am a slave to Jesus. Meaning and showing that his life is now in the hands of the one who paid the price for his sins, that Jesus bought Paul through his death on the cross. And we can see this in 1 Corinthians 6.20 where Paul writes again to the Corinthian church, he says, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your bodies. So he then continues in verses 2 through 4, where he says, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, where Paul has been called to be a proclaimer of the gospel. In a sense, the gospel is God's gospel. It's not just the gospel which is talking about Jesus and his redemptive plan for us, but it is also who is the author of that gospel, that it is, it is God who is the author of it. We talked about how gospel literally means good news last week, and the thing is that everyone used the word gospel back in the day. The difference is that the gospel of God was different than the gospel of the king, whereas, <laughs> sorry, the gospel of the king would have been like if they're having a son, because this is the culture, if they had a son, it was super celebratory, or if they won a battle, they would talk about that as being gospel. But Paul setting this apart, saying that this is God's gospel. This is God's good news. This isn't just any ordinary good news. So this, this verbiage and the way that Paul's talking about, he's saying that he's a slave to Jesus, shows us that it is so incredible, that it, that it is it is perfect in, in all that it is, um, and that God, who is the author of redemption for his people by his love and grace through Jesus. And then, so it goes on to say, which was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David. We can see that. Oh, sorry. And then we can also see how all of the promised prophecies came true through Jesus. So I'm sure that you guys know this from going to church and you know that, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, but the logistics of that you may, may not know. So I, I just did a quick look because I wasn't sure exactly how many prophecies were actually true through Jesus. And the, the most basic, some, some studies say upwards of 500 prophecies from Old Testament to New Testament. Some say about 400, but just bare minimum, at least 300 prophecies were fulfilled from Jesus the promised Messiah and King who came through the lineage of David. Um, so we can look back to the very first prophecy that was ever proclaimed 
where it came with a curse and with a promise all in the same thing. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God is telling the serpent, Satan, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So Jesus, born of the family lineage of David, like coming down the family tree of David, crushed Satan's head and rose again, proving his victory over sin, death, and Satan himself. And then we can see that it is proven the Holy Spirit through Jesus, through his resurrection, um, that he is the Son of God in the flesh, which is so important. That, that's, that's how we know that the gospel is God's gospel. That's how we know that Jesus truly is God, which is so important for our faith. And for this last part, so through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, sorry, last little bit here. So it is through Jesus that we have received grace, which grace we know is a free gift. Um, and this apostleship or this talk about the elect for those who are believers, it can be related to us as all of us who are Christians. Every, this is the call for every Christian, where God calls us to place our faith in him and put our entire trust in him. Faith is, is a trusting in the Lord and trusting in his promises. And it is to bring about obedience for the sake of Jesus' name. That's what Paul's talking about. That's where he's, he's saying this encouragement. And so saving faith is marked by an obedience to God's word and striving to do so. It's not for the sake of saving our own skins, but it's for the sake of showing gratitude to God who pulled us out of darkness into the beautiful presence of his glorious light. Like, this is a beautiful thing where we're completely incapable of saving ourselves, but God, out of his great love and mercy, he pulled us out of darkness and pulled us into his light. So now we live in a way that is different. And Paul concludes this section of the letter in the book of Romans that it's written, talking about the gospel being set apart. It is, it is set apart. It is, it is like nothing else. And that God intimately and exclusively loves his people different than the people of the world. Because God showed his love by pulling us out of our sin, pulling us into relationship with him. It is all a complete work of him. That you Christians, that you may be filled with God's grace and peace. And to be filled with God's peace, no matter the external turmoil that you have going on in your life. It is to be filled with a peace and a presence that even though things are going on around you, his promises and the significance of that it is his gospel can fill us and can give us joy. So then we're going to be going on to the second portion. So Paul's longing to go to Rome. So Kobe, do you want to get that for us? Yeah. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit and the gospel of the Son. That without ceasing I miss you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God, God's will, I may now at least succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to strengthen you. That is, that we may mutually be encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far may have been for love. In order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you, all those who are hard and not Awesome. Thank you. Yes, and so it's this preaching, this preaching verse by verse, like getting to understand like the intricacies and like why why is this being put in here? I, I think so many times we read over a scripture first glance and it's like, I don't even know what's going on. Um, and it's like, oh, we'll just move on to the next part, and maybe it'll be something I'll understand. Um, so that's that's just a, another another thing of like, this is what the intentionality of breaking down the verses so that we can we can comprehend it, that we can look at it um, in a in a way that's understandable. Um, so Paul starts off this section with verse eight by thanking God through Jesus for the impact in which the believers have had in Rome on the world. He uses this term, the world. Um, so at this time, he's talking about the known world, where this is this is the central area in the Middle East, and like he's not talking about anything in like 
North America or South America, it's like it is right here. This is where the gospel is at. And so he's he's saying like how it is so incredible the way that the gospel is just like spreading like wildfire among among this area to all all these different areas. And people are encouraged by these Christians that are in Rome. Um, it's a it's a it's an awesome thing. And Paul's wanting to give give credit to this. Um, and that the gospel is not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles. It's for not only the Jews who were God's chosen people right away, but also the gospel is open to all those who are not Jews, which I think that would include all of us. Where it's like, praise the Lord. Like, we don't need to be born of a specific, a specific family tree or a specific lineage. That it is all who come to the cross and confess and place their faith in Jesus may be saved. It is a beautiful thing. Super, super cool. And then we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 15 as we see it's kind of this, this longing to go to Rome. So Paul's just showing his heart and his depth of his desire to see fellow Christians. Like he is just writing this letter because he wants to see other Christians. And it's a beautiful thing that you guys have people side by side right next to you right now. Like you get to be in community with other believers. You get to go to a school where all of you guys go to pretty much the same school where you guys get to see other Christians, other believers, to be able to have this gladness, to be able to, like, these are my people. It's not just the people that are on your sports team or it's not just the people that you're in in math club with. Like, it is Christians. Like, they, it should give us a joy to see one another and to be in each other's presence, to be able to point each of us towards truth. And it's, it's awesome to see just Paul's heart where he's saying, that if it is within God's will, that he may come. Where there's so many times where it's like, oh man, I, I, I desire, I, I wish that I could, I could go and, and go and do this activity, or I had plans with friends. I think I need to go to the next section. Right here. Where it's talk, talking about how you want to go somewhere, and if you're planning with friends, or you're planning with family, and if plans fall through, it's always like, oh, it's a huge bummer. But it's like Paul trusting in the Lord that God is sovereign, that he is in control of everything, that he will have everything that he means to happen, happen. And so he's saying, he's looking on the positive outside, that he's looking to be able to see the spiritual harvest that is to come. Which, if you guys have heard of like spiritual maturity in a sense of... spiritual maturity in a sense of plants. So some people prepare the soil. <clears throat> some people plant the seeds. Some water the crop. Some weed the plants. And some partake in the spiritual harvest. So Paul spent many times in all these areas. Um, but he's talking about how the beautiful thing of being able to partake in the harvest when he finally goes and he sees them. And in verses 14 and 15, his mission is to share the saving gospel of Jesus Christ with all the world. To the Greeks who were rich, smart, at the top of society, and also to the barbarians, which he's referring to here, the outcasts, the poor, at the bottom of the totem pole, these would be the people that would be considered the slaves of this time. Of course, the gospel is for everyone. Jesus is for everyone. So we go into this, this final section. Anyone want to read these two verses for us? <coughs> For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is written, or no, for in it, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteousness shall live by faith. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, Paul powerfully, powerfully proclaimed that he was not ashamed of the gospel in the first century where the world was utterly more hostile to Christians than the nation that we live in today. Paul introduces himself, as we saw, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. He introduces himself as not only to other believers that he is a slave to Christ, but he's also saying it to unbelievers. And he said it to a world and a culture that would end up taking him in, taking him to jail, and martyring him. And, and killing him for the faith that he had in Jesus. Paul 
truly was not ashamed of the gospel. He took it all the way with him to his death. And the reason for that is because Paul believed in the promises of God. And also it is because Paul understood the gravity of denying Jesus when Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, 26, Jesus says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. For those who are ashamed of Jesus, Jesus will be ashamed of them before God the Father. It is, a, it is a thing that if we are a Christian, we are not ashamed of Christ because we trust in him. We trust in his promises that he is the king, that he has his sovereignty covering the whole world of all, all evil and all, all things. So Paul proclaimed the gospel of Jesus. As we look, this is another Greek word, which I think is super fun. But his word for power here is dunamos, which we have our modern word dynamite for that. Or that's, that's super, super awesome. So R.C. Sproul, he's a theologian and pastor, um, and he wrote that the power of the gospel is literally dynamite. And then he continues with this, this little phrase, um, as we're getting close to wrapping up here, but God's priority is that people understand his holy character. The gospel is all about that. It's all about us seeing God's holy character. People may not feel their need of that, but there is nothing they need more than to have their minds exploded in their understanding of who God is. So that is that's awesome. It's incredible. At the end of verse 17, Paul quotes Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, that the righteous shall live by faith pointing towards how those who have received the unmerited grace of salvation by faith, completely unearned, it is, it is a free gift of God, are to continue to live by faith each and every day. So, to conclude, the only solution to the great need of the Roman Empire is the gospel. That's why Paul is writing this. The greatest need is not for kingdoms to fall or for living conditions to improve or for freedom from the oppression of wrathful rulers. Nothing, nothing compares to the greatest need for the, Christ, for the citizens in Rome, but the gospel. The greatest need for this world and for you is the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified. For I am, am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who places their entire trust and faith in the Son of God, Jesus. God is the author of the gospel, and Jesus is the world's only savior from sin and eternal death. And the gospel is not just the initial call for a sinner to die to themselves and pick up their cross, to be a disciple and follower of Jesus, but the gospel is the continual call to continue to keep on walking by faith every day for the rest of your life. It is not just the day that you place your faith in him because you wake up each day continuing to place your faith in him, continuing to trust in his promises, that you may live a life that is honorable to your heavenly father. And so to those who are faithful and obedient, there is a promise of a saving relationship which leads to an eternal reward in heaven. Continue to push on in faith. This is for you guys. Continue to push on in faith. Trust in the promises of God that have always come true. And make your life a living sacrifice for the one who has redeemed you. It is no longer us who live for ourselves, but Christ who lives in us. And our lives are to display a total commitment to Jesus. And so, our greatest need is Jesus and his gospel. So, commit and submit your life to him. Then be transformed by his spirit, for his promises always come true. Okay, I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the heart of Paul that you gave him to be trustworthy in your message at all times, with all things surrounding him. Um, Lord, I pray that your word can transform us, that it can shape us, that, Lord, your spirit can come upon us, that, Lord, we can be encouraged um, that... Our greatest need is not the things of this world, but our greatest need is the thing that is not of this world, which is you. 
and it is your saving work that you have done on the cross through Jesus. So, Lord, we, we come before you, and we give thanks to you. In your holy name. Amen. Okay, so now we're going to go into small groups.